Brendan, of course, we talk about Cathay and its various woes every time we get you on. Does this move the needle at all? Um, I mean, uh, uh, yes. I mean, first of all, uh, with the job cuts, they, they were inevitable. I mean, Cathay Pacific has been in uh, in this in crisis mode for like a year and a half. So in, in addition to the seven months of the global crisis, they, they had uh, COVID earlier because of mainland China and Hong Kong, and they had, of course, protests last year. So, so it's amazing, actually, that they've been able to not have job cuts so far. Almost the entire industry has had job cuts, you know, and 20 to 30 percent is kind of a normal number. Uh, so, so it's not surprising that this has happened this morning, and um, they they also are announced the um, elimination of the Cafe Dragon brand, which is also not surprising. Uh, Silk Air, a similar brand, is going away in Singapore, and makes a lot of sense to go forward with that now and slim down and become more efficient. Uh, so they can move on now and, and focus on better things like um, hopefully the start of the recovery in the international market, which will be very long and and gradual. So it will take a lot of time. So they have to kind of become leaner and more efficient in the meantime. That sounds like you expect more restructuring to come. But in terms of this uh, Hong Kong-Singapore travel bubble, uh, I mean, symbolically, it's a bit of positive sentiment, right? But the numbers are not exactly game-changing. Um, I mean, the, the numbers are, are game-changing um, related relative to the current levels of traffic for Cathay Pacific and the Hong Kong Hub, as well as Singapore Airlines and the Cheng Singapore Changi Hub. I mean, these, these airports are, are going at, you know, 100,000 passengers a month at the moment, and, and this bubble could, could potentially generate 200,000 passengers a month uh, once it gets fully going. It won't like, be like that in initial months, but if it ramps up to what demand would be and, um, and there's containment in both places, which is a big if, of course, uh, it could become that significant. Now, um, the, the bigger picture, though, is would be that this is bubbles followed by lots of other bubbles for Hong Kong and Singapore, as well as bubbles throughout the region, which would help improve their transit traffic um, and make uh, the, these hubs become come back to life, basically, to some extent. It's not going to be a huge recovery until there's until there's a vaccination, but we can see, you know, traffic go up, you know, by to 20 to 30 percent normal levels at least um, next year. That would be the hope. So better than nothing. Cathay is saying that the restructuring will cut monthly cash burn by 500 million Hong Kong dollars in 2021. How much liquidity do they still have left, given that we really don't know when international demand will return to normal? Uh, I mean, they, they had these, the big uh, financial restructuring with the government coming in. Uh, so, I mean, Cathay Pacific as well as Singapore Airlines uh, are pretty much the best uh, Position financially right now in terms of cash liquidity. I mean, they, they're in a very weak position with no domestic markets, but they're in a lot better uh, position than most of the airlines, particularly in Southeast Asia. The other airlines besides Singapore Airlines Group are, you know, haven't really raised liquidity, don't have much government support, and are really uh, battling it out with suppliers right now to avoid uh, liquidation or bankruptcy. So, I mean, I think a lot of focus or too much focus is on Cathay and Singapore when actually their long-term financial position is actually strong, and they and they have what it takes to weather this storm and come out up on the other end potentially in good position if there's consolidation in the region. Here's a, a sort of an estimate from IATA when it comes to the uh, demand levels for international travel. Uh, take a listen first. Frankly speaking, we, we think that uh, it'll take until 2024 to get back to 2019 levels for international travel. Domestic travel will, uh, will bounce back sooner. 2024 for international travel, how many airlines will remain in business until then and how much more consolidation could we see? Yeah, I mean, so the IAD has been saying this for a while now. That, that was Conrad Clifford for the head of IAD in Asia. I recognize the voice. And um, yeah, I, I agree. It's it's going to take until 2024 for, for, for a full recovery. Um, and domestic is starting to recover, but it's, it's a gradual thing. And international will, will start in earnest once there's a vaccination. But, but you know, a lot of patterns will... Uh, travel patterns will have changed and it'll take some time for the airlines to recover, but they're restructuring now. I mean, that's why you see this job cut at Cathay, for example, uh, and, and similar job cuts, 20, 30 percent at a lot of airlines, because they know that that uh, even 2022, 2023, when, when there hopefully is a recovery uh, to some extent and a vaccination, it's not just going to go back to pre-COVID levels. It'll take longer to get back to that level. So you can't just hang on to that capacity to those jobs. From a financial perspective, the, the issue is, is that you, they're adding a lot of debt and it's going to take a long time to pay back that debt. And this is going to be a hole the industry has to come out of for a long, long time. Not only airlines, but also, uh, you know, the other companies around the airlines are going to start getting impacted more over the next year. Um, but, I mean, it, depending on the government support, I don't think we'll see that many bankruptcies. Um, if the governments don't continue to support the airlines, then we might see more bankruptcies and, and collapses. 
Brendan, I think the last time we spoke, we talked about Qantas as being one of the best positioned because of the strong domestic business factor. That's obviously taken a beating with the lockdowns and the closure of borders uh, related to Victoria in, in particular. Are you still optimistic that they'll come out once we get domestic borders reopen? Yeah, I mean, Australia is really underperforming domestically right now compared to other markets in Asia Pacific. I mean, domestic's been down the last few months well over 80% still, and it should be doing a lot better. I mean, we've had the Victoria issue, but even excluding Victoria, um, this, you know, the, there's just not enough domestic travel in, in Australia because of these uh, border closures internally. So you only have that limited travel, like within Queensland and within WA for the most part. Uh, it's very limited uh, domestic travel. So I, th I think there's some hopeful signs now that some of those domestic borders like Tasmania and, and, and hopefully Queensland and, and South Australia uh, NT is, is also opening up. So, I mean, that's going to improve the situation. I'm, I'm only a little bit uh, wondering about if WA is ever going to open up. But everyone else should open up, hopefully by the end of the year. That will improve domestic. And also we have this better talk or, or more encouraging talk from Australia now about international, potentially a two-way bubble with New Zealand uh, and, and maybe Singapore as well and, and some other markets like Hong Kong. I, I actually see some opening up rather than waiting until middle of next year, which is what they were saying initially. Uh, so, so that's encouraging, um, but it's, it's slow and, um, you know, and, and the, it, will, it remains to be seen um, if, if this gets implemented or not, because there's been so much U-turns uh, in Australia as well as in a lot of the other countries. You know, one month they say, ah, they make it sound like they're going to open up, and the next month they turn back around and make it sound like they don't open up. So um, mm. let's get, keep our fingers crossed and be cautiously optimistic that some airlines uh, are going to have some good news in the months ahead and that we're that the lights at the end of the tunnel and that we're actually through the worst of this.